Today I'm going to take a look at the first half of uh, 1 Nephi 8, uh, the Lehi's dream or vision. The chapter begins with a brief notice that they're gathering seeds. It's not clear if these are to plant while they're in the wilderness or they're planned for use in the future colony. I think they're probably for immediate use because they make a larger collection later on in 1611. So they're there waiting in the wilderness uh, in the tent of Lehi, and Lehi has this dream. Now notice all of the action in the Book of Mormon up till this time has been stimulated by dreams or visions of Lehi, of one sort or another. So you've got Nephi, uh, Lehi dreaming a dream or seeing a vision. Now that's a classic example of a Hebrew cognate accusative. Uh, that is a particular grammatical form of of using a verb and a noun in a in a combination there, and it's uh, also uh, visible in English in the Bible. I've listed some passages there about dreaming dreams. So, so it's a good uh, Hebrew, good contextual idea from ancient Hebrew society. So he has this dream, and basically, because of the dream, he rejoices because of Sam and Nephi. But he's worried because of Laman and Lemuel. So he fears for them. And he also rejoices for the, uh, the seed of Nephi and Sam. And this may be related uh, subconsciously to his gathering seeds at this time. While he's gathering seeds, he has a dream. And he dreams about not the seeds of his garden, but the seeds of his family. And you can see this kind of reflected a lot in this dream, that the, it it kind of reflects the actual circumstances they're in there in the wilderness, kind of a subconscious uh, recreation of the anxieties of Lehi in his uh, wilderness state. Notice that Lehi's dream is about his personal circumstances and his family. It's not about, uh, you know, cosmic issues. Only when Nephi has the uh, a different revelation of the vision do we find the emphasis changing? But throughout chapter 8 with Lehi's vision, it's all about his own circumstances and the situation of his family. So he dreams the dream, he sees this vision, and he gathers his family around and he says, look guys, I'm happy for Nephi and Sam, but I'm very worried about Laman and Lemuel. And then he explains why by recounting this dream. So the dream begins in, a, in the wilderness, uh, in verse 4b, uh, I thought, me thought I saw in my dream a dark and dreary wilderness. Now, this term wilderness has been used consistently throughout 1 Nephi as a term for the area in Arabia where they've settled, the area away from Judea, away from Jerusalem. Um, again, I think this probably reflects, reflects his personal situation. He's in the wilderness. This is where he is. And in, in reality, Lehi's dream, he falls asleep, he has this visionary dream, and it begins precisely where he is in the material world. That is to say, he's in the wilderness, it's dark, and it's night. In the dream, an uh, interesting thing occurs, and that is a man dressed in a white robe came and stood before him. Now we've had, uh, this is the fourth uh, revelatory figure that occurs in the Book of Mormon. The first one is, is just called the One uh, in uh, one eleven. In 329, it's explicitly said to be an angel, this revelatory figure. And then in 4, 10 to 13, it's called the Spirit. Now, we don't know if this is the same, different names for the same figure, or each one was entirely different. Um, it seems very likely, given uh, the future discussion, that this figure is an angel. The fact that he's dressed in a white robe is also reflects a kind of apocalyptic worldview. The white robe is standard angelic dress in the Bible, but it is also the standard clothes of the temple priests. And this is because temple priests were simply earthly manifestations of the celestial angelic priests. They were, you know, there's a celestial uh, priesthood, and there is a, a terrestrial priesthood, 
and they both do the same type of thing, and they both wear the same type of robes, and they both function in the temple. There's a celestial temple where the uh, celestial priesthood wears their white robes and performs uh, their rituals, and then the earthly temple. Now, a new book just came out recently on uh, celestial priests and priesthood. It's by uh, Angel there, appropriate name. Uh, Professor Angel wrote a book on otherworldly priesthood. Very interesting stuff in there. Uh, another thing to note is that angelic guides are very common in revelatory apocalyptic literature, that there is a figure who explains and guides the visionary through the vision. So, so this fits quite appropriately within the context of uh, ancient Jewish uh, revelatory dreams and visions and apocalypses and so forth. So he's in the wilderness and, and a person appears to him and he says, come with me, follow me, which interestingly is, is what um, Jesus says to his disciples as well, come follow me. Now, this guy is guiding him, and it's not clear at this point whether Lehi thinks this figure is going to guide him out of the wilderness or guide him to spiritual salvation. I think allegorically it's exactly the same, but at this point he is just guiding Lehi out of the wilderness. Um, now notice also that this figure never explains anything to Lehi. He guides Lehi to the tree, and that's about it. So it's, it's a quite a different function than we see for the um, celestial guide for Nephi in his vision. So Lehi takes off. He starts following this guide through the uh, wilderness. And uh, he followed him. And Lehi then finds himself in a dark and dreary waste. Now, it's, it's often assumed that this is just another word for wilderness, but in fact, uh, within Hebrew and the King James Version and the Book of Mormon, for that matter, all three use the terms in the same way. That is, waste is not a synonym for wilderness. It's an entirely different idea. The net result is the same. That is, it's empty, uninhabited land. But a waste is a ruin. It is destroyed human habitation. So whatever a human makes, if it's destroyed in a ruinous condition, that is a waste. And the Bible talks, uses this type of language most when it refers to, a, you know, a, they laid waste the city or they laid waste the fields or, or something like that. That's what they're talking about. So there's, there's several different Hebrew words which translate into King James as waste. Um... I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through all the details of these, but, but most of these refer to devastated buildings or cities or agricultures. Now notice the term devastate in English, in fact, is simply a, a modification of de-wasted. That is, it's, it's something that has been wasted is devastated. Same thing happens in the Book of Mormon. I've listed several references there in the Book of Mormon, uh, most of the major ones where the term waste is used for uh, destruction of human habitation, human cities, buildings, lands, etc., etc. So what's going on in the dream, uh, and I think this is important to note, is that Lehi is moving from an ecological wilderness to a culturally desolate and devastated wasteland where once humans lived. So this element kind of picks up a little bit into the prophetic issues that will become very important later on, because what's going on here, I think, is that the waste, the dark and dreary waste, is the ruins of uh, destroyed Jerusalem. It's a prophetic vision of what Jerusalem is like after it's destroyed. Now, the reasons for this will come later. It's not I mean, right now I'm just asserting it, but I think there's some good evidence for this later on in the in the chapter. So we'll, I'll pursue that later. But for right now, that's my interpretation, is that the dark and dreary waste is devastated Jerusalem after the Babylonian conquest. Okay, so Lehi travels many hours in darkness, and I, I interpret this as both the travel time in the dark wilderness and the dark waste, because both are dark, remember. And now he, he, when he gets to the dark and dreary waste, this wasteland, he starts to pray to the Lord to have mercy upon him and to, to provide his tender mercies. Now notice in 120, where this phrase tender mercies occurs earlier, 
it, it's in reference to deliverance from the destruction that's coming upon Jerusalem. So in fact, that, that there's a vague ver verbal allusion to that same type of an idea there. So now we come to the Tree of Life uh, section of uh, Lehi's vision, which is verses um, 9 to 13, and then it, this is going to be picked up by Nephi's vision in chapter 11 as well. Now notice at this point, I'm not looking to Nephi to try to explain Lehi. Um, I think it's important to just take Lehi's vision as an independent revelation and see what it means before we turn to the other visions, because this becomes a very complicated matter, the way all the ramifications of this vision play out. You know, just taken alone, it's quite a different vision than what Nephi has. Okay, so the uh, guide lead, leads Lehi to a large and spacious field, which I think is oasis imagery. Remember, Lehi's in the wilderness, he's out in the desert, and suddenly you find this uh, large um, green area, and you've got an oasis. And it's, of course, got tree and water and all the things that you'd see in an oasis. So this is classic oasis imagery which makes perfect sense in the desert setting in which Lehi is having this dream. Notice also the phrase large and spacious field, I think, is maybe a conscious contrast between the great and spacious building, which will occur later. But Now, within the field is a tree with uh, wonderful fruit. This is, um, it's desirable, it makes you happy. All of this is based on a lot of uh, kind of pre- Lehite uh, biblical imagery, which I'm going to post on my webpage. Uh, there's lots of references to these, the, the fruit of the tree that makes you happy or makes you wise or things like this. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it here, but I will post a sheet, a, a PDF on my webpage, which will give you that information. Now notice in Lehi's vision, this is not called the tree of life. It only is called Tree of Life by Nephi in chapter 11. In Lehi, it's simply a tree, a tree in a field, with a spring and uh, some water flowing by it. S just straight oasis imagery, but also probably Edenic imagery, paradisical garden Edenic imagery. So the, he sees this tree. He uh, goes up. He tastes it. It's fantastically sweet. It's desirable. It makes you happy. It's this wonderful fruit. Uh, strange thing is it's white, uh, extremely white, which of course is not typical of, of, of most fruits. Um, some people think uh, that this is probably reflecting an apocalyptic eschatological type fruit uh, rather than a natural fruit. And, and that's probably what's going on here, why the fruit is white. So he eats the food, his fruit, his uh, soul is filled with joy, just as uh, the uh, eating fruit fills your stomach with joy. Here it fills your soul with joy rather than a natural uh, food. And as soon as he eats it, he wants his family to take it as well. Now notice, again, here Lehi is focusing uh, almost exclusively on his family. He wants to share his joy with his family. And now we begin to see probably this is a uh, symbolic allegory where the partaking of the fruit is the uh, revelations that God has given him and the salvation that will come to God. And his trying to share this with his family is his preaching and uh, revealing his dreams and visions to his family, which of course has caused all sorts of problems in the family uh, in the previous chapters. So he looks around trying to find his family, hoping he can call them to the tree, and sure enough, he does. This then takes us to the river of water scene, which is 8, uh, 13 to 18. So he looks around for his family, and instead he finds a river of water uh, that flows near the tree. This river of water language comes out of uh, 2 Nephi there. I listed the references, and, and maybe an allusion to the river of water scene in... Um, chapter 2, but I think it's probably just a what you would see at an oasis, a spring with some water flowing out of it. As background to this, we find that in Eden, the tree of life is surrounded by a garden, just as this was surrounded by a field, and a spring 
springs up by the tree of life, which flows out to water the whole world, according to Genesis 2.10. And this image of a paradisical river flowing from, the, from paradise, from the garden, is found in lots of different passages. I've given them there in the Old Testament. So this is a, a fairly standard and important um, Old Testament concept, Hebrew Bible concept of the paradisical river. So he sees this river, and his interest at this point is not directed towards the river, but rather towards who's by the river. And he, he keeps looking, and he sees the head of the river, which I suspect means a spring from which the, the stream is flowing. And um, there he sees his family. First he notices Sam, uh, Sariah, Sam, and Nephi, but later on Laman and Lemler are going to be exactly the same place. So they're all up there by the spring. Now notice, the first three people he, he sees are Sariah, Sam, and Nephi, and all of those had previously accepted uh, Lehi's visions and the authenticity of his revelations. I've given the passages there. So he's, he's clearly seen one group, which are those who have believe him and therefore have partaken of his fruit that is, his, his revelations and so forth. So he calls them over and uh, invites them all to partake of the fruit, which is desirable above all others. And they do. That's the important thing. They did come and partake. So then he sees Laman and Lemuel, and they're in exactly the same place. They're at the head of the river. But notice these are the ones who have rejected his visions and rejected his authenticity as a prophet. He, he summons them, and notice that uh, they do not come unto me, and partake of the fruit. And that's, again, the exact phraseology, the opposite. So here we have then Lehi's dream reflecting the crisis that he has in his own family, which is some will partake of the fruit and some will not. 